So I would want you to explain the three different kind of verticals. So we are very revenue focused firm. Whatever we build has to pass head into revenue. What do you think are the key reasons for India being a credit thirsty country and this trend keeping up since a lot of decades? You know, a lot of macroeconomic data has thrown out to us in terms of credit to GDP ratio. Any last advice for our audience and for the budding entrepreneurs in today's generation? Like what to do and what not to do. And I will just say two things. Welcome everyone to another episode of Startup Stories India, powered by LegalPay, wherein we meet new entrepreneurs every week and discuss their journey and how they have built something of their own. So today I have extreme honor to invite Mr. Nitin onto our platform. Mr. Nitin is the founder and CEO of Navadan Capital, which is a trailblazing venture in the realm of innovation and technology. Serving more than 2 lakh customers, Navadan provides financial services to the underbanked populations. So, welcome Mr. Nitin. Welcome to Startup Stories India. Thank you, Samuel. Well. Happy to be here. So, Mr. Nitin, I uh, came across the tagline for Navadan, which is New Wealth for the Underbanked, which is a very interesting proposition. So, I just want to dive deeper into this and I want you to explain our audience what Navadan is and what are you building. And specifically, what do you mean by underbanked? Sure. So let me take last the first. So underbanked are those people who have access to bank accounts, but they don't have access to the full suite of banking services. So just as an example, okay. I may have a bank account, but I am not able to access loans for the purpose that I need the loans. I may, for instance, assume that I am a small entrepreneur in a rural setup. I, if I have a considered land, I may get a Kisan credit card. If uh, yeah. you know I belong to the lower income segment, my wife may be eligible for getting a micro loan or a micro finance. But if I run a small business, today I do not have access to working capital. I don't have access to capex financing kind of. So that's the underbanked part where you have access to banking, but your requirements are not being free. And when Understood. it comes to Lahadar, we looked at this segment and said that how can we help this segment get more access to credit such that they can improve the businesses, improve their incomes, improve their well-beings, which leads to new wealth creation. Hence the name now. Okay. Great. Great. So how has the journey been for you for building Navadan Sin? Okay. You are a veteran in the sense that you have worked for the last two decades in the financial industry and being CEO of various major organizations as well. So how has the journey been from a corporate life to setting up something of your own? Well, it's been full of emotions, full of passion, full of compassion. Uh, it's been pretty exciting, honestly. Uh, I think uh, through this journey, we've had enough uh, trials and tribulations. One of the biggest trials was that as soon as we started, we had the COVID season hitting us. But that yeah. uh, that whole thing turned into an opportunity because we spent a good two years initially in the life of Navadhan to build out our tech net. So we invested heavily in terms of both our time and energies to build the tech platform, which had both the retail customer side of enablements as well as the lender side of enablements to make the markets work or the formal markets work for the financial service providers. We did all of this work first two years before we actually started operations. And once okay. the product was ready, once and we call it as ASIN Tech Platform, once the ASIN Tech Platform was ready, uh, we did the first release about three years back and uh, we started lending operations. We were also very cognizant that our gains were to come down heavily on fintech space and uh, regulations yes. will be role. Hence, the other thing that we did during the first two years was take an NBFC license. So we built out the tech okay. platform, the NBFC license, and we started. Uh, and after that, the journey has been exciting. I think the response from customer has really overwhelmed us. The response from our team has has, has been very, very kind. The mission alignment, all of that has, has really worked for us. Uh, and I've been lucky to have, you know, a wonderful set of co-founders who have led the team beautifully and, you know, kind of, further proliferated the mission by having like-minded people joining the team and joining the sole mission. Fairly understood. So, a uh, couple of questions to that. So, you <laughs> mentioned that you first built the tech platform <laughs> for the initial two years and then you took out the license 
and then you started your lending operations which in contrary is to many other fintechs wherein they first start their operations and tie up with a lot of nbfcs to start their lending operations so was that a conscious decision like you would first get the license and then start your operations well i think uh, that's that's the correct way to go about it you know first you build the processes build the tech platform and then then start the business i think most of the fintechs do it that way uh, by just in- getting a license does not mean we had the access to funding license was just to make sure that yes. we are a regulated it while we also had to follow the same suit of going to nbfcs and banks and tying up with them so as we speak we have 20 lender partners on the black essentially bank and nbfcs which participate with us having the license is just a just an additional benefit to us one it makes us regulated yeah. and therefore we are the good boys uh, and following like the rules of the game yeah. the second is it allows us to go right. lending along with some of our jet but because we see a lot of base like rbi is heavily wetting the compliances of all the fintechs like we saw what happened with ptm so i think that's the right way now to go about it that first you build out your tech platform and be a regulated entity and then uh commence your operations in such a way that you know rbi does not poach your hunt you down in the longer run so uh, one thing i wanted to bring right upon is how is your tech mechanism different from other fintech or lending companies because you yourself also have a bit of a background about the tech so how important is tech integration into navadan's operations well i would say tech is the starting point because we are a tech first business um, so if there was no tech we would not have a business in place hey here it started that we are building a tech platform for the purpose where we are catering to the bottom two thirds of the population so this is a tech for purpose platform in the sense that most of the solutions that we have built are such that while the rest of the fintech world is busy you know handling the top one third of the market we are looking at the bottom two thirds of the market which is uh, less digitally included and building solutions so that yeah. you know there was informal markets those bottom two thirds of the economy can be brought to to the mainstream using technology as an enabler now in in lot of ways this is an ironical statement but it is true that unless you solve tech with tech it is not going to get solved so that's exactly okay. what we're doing we're building tech for purpose right such that it solves for the segment and you know makes it a long linear business okay and since you are catering to the bottom two third of the population so how important is the trust factor in such a lending business because we see that those population relate more with banks and less with nbfcs which was the scene in the last two decades if i see the indian landscape so how were you able to generate that trust trust with that two third population well trust is not a function of being a bank or an nbfc or a fintech trust is a function of reinforcement of delivering on promises uh, so i wouldn't see just by being a bank you get trust because people are disenchanted by not being able to smoothly deposit cash forget about accessing other financial services because uh, there are challenges of operating a bank branch in rural areas uh, and therefore banks find it very tough to provide the same quality of service that they do in urban spaces you know it's very rarely people appreciate right. the fact that just depositing cash in a bank branch in rural areas can itself be a task can be challenging and it comes at a cost of uh, you know loss of life you know at times having said that uh, trust is extremely important in financing business trust comes from service quality hence irrespective of the type of business you are if you're dealing with consumers and if you deliver on your promises and you do responsible business practices that's where you know our base fair practices scores also comes in if you follow responsible business practices if you're transparent about your charges if you regularly follow through if you have turned around times so service qualities and uh, to be maintained the customers do come back i think a, a very important element there is also you know trust begets trust right so while service quality ensures trust yeah. trust itself builds on more people having trust and and especially in rural and the informal markets the word of mouth spreads very very fast so it's it's it it has a compounding effect in that sense understood understood fairly agree and like 
you mentioned that you have 20 plus lenders as of today onboarded with Navadan, which includes a lot of major banks and NBFCs as well. So I want to like want you to dissect the supplier side of the business in the lending space. How tough is it to get suppliers on board when you're just starting out a new venture? And since you're catering to that portion of the market, which other players are not very much focused on. So how difficult was that journey? And how is it now? Like, has the proof of concept been installed and now it's easier to get partnerships in that sense? Well, for Nakhtar, getting partnerships was never tough. Uh, it was always good. It was always easy part. I think the challenge has been more in terms of how we have managed to build on the execution side. I think it comes from the fact that we are not fresh blokes out of college who are trying to do lending. We are people all with grey hair. My co-founders are people who have spent uh, you know, long years in the space. So we enjoy that kind of relationships yep. and enjoy that kind of trust with the banking system. Having said that, Every journey is a new start and it starts from zero. To that extent, what we have delivered so far yeah. in the last few years has helped us, you know, their trust, you know, repeating on the word, playing on the same word. And we have sufficient inbound interest in terms of expanding partnerships. I think one of the key reasons also is because the assets that we are generating, the type of loans that we make, are all qualified as priority sector assets. And there is sufficient demand for priority sector oh. assets in the banking space. Because that's what most banks have. That's number one. Number two is we have managed to maintain good portfolio qualities through a very strong underwriting and, you know, customer service processes. So those two things have helped us attract enough inbound interest or partnerships. And it's upon us to, you know, kind of continuing to continue to strengthen the platform strengthen the capability and the throughputs to get to more and more parts. I completely agree that when you mentioned that you're not blocks out of college, you are starting a lending business, you have been the veteran in that space. So it it really acts as a benefiting point when you're building something of your own. So now there are a couple of interesting questions in my mind regarding the two points you mentioned. So first I'll come to the underwriting part because you mentioned that I also saw on your one of your LinkedIn posts wherein you mentioned that underwriting will win the race in the long run. And we also saw the article wherein Mr. Dinesh Hare, who is the chairman of SBI, said that unsecured loans, not a worry for SBI. So he said that their unsecured book is more safer than their secured books, which was like an ironical statement to many of us. So please, I want you to dissect this and I want you to dive deeper into this and what role do you feel underwriting plays in any lending business and specifically for Navadan? Well, sure. So these are two different questions uh, and let me take them one at a time. On the unsecured, secured part, there are two schools of thought. One school of thought is because the word secured mentions secured. People think it is more secure. Well, that's never true. Then my, if I give you a loan with your house property on uh, as a, a pledge to me, I can probably get it vacated. But if I do that same thing in a rural area, or if I do that with a shop, which is a livelihood of a person, even the courts wouldn't allow me to make the person vacate the house. So secured lending in India, being more secure than unsecured yeah. is a misconception. There is a regulatory arbitrage that secured loans and peer recognition can be delayed. And a lot of people think that it means that you don't need to worry about the portfolio quality of secure loans. For me and players like players who have a long-term view, we would rather more worry about our service quality, our collections capability, and not worry about secured arts. And hence, I come back to your original point of underwriting. Well, underwriting becomes naturally lenient in case of secured lending because you're relying on the value of the underlying asset being pledged. While doing unsecured lending, you need to really, yes. really slog it out and, and develop mechanisms, templates, understand the livelihoods, understand the cash flows, discount it for various risks that would come in the future and build a robust model. The way we have done it in Lapdhan is use tech for that purpose. So we are in an age where enough data and, and digital footprint is available. It may not necessarily be fully sufficient to underwrite okay. But to the extent that the digital is available and data is available, we have built tools and mechanisms 
to underwrite based on that. So, for instance, we have developed an artificial intelligence wrapper around the credit bureau raw data, where we do not rely on the credit scores offered by the bureaus, but to our own credit assessment after cleaning and scrubbing okay. the data and arriving at, at, at some intelligence search. We have a machine learning model around agri cash flows predictions. We have templatized some of the regular uh, rural businesses where we are able to do better predictive cash flow analysis. We understand rural household economics better and which indicators play over the other. For example, in a rural household, somebody falling sick is a massive risk. That's one risk which you cannot underwrite. Yes. But you can definitely underwrite risks associated with migration, ability to do multiple income generation, you know, ability to have more entrepreneurial behavior at a household level than otherwise. Somebody stays on a rented premises or a old premise. So there are indicators which can be used as surveys and discount. So we have built models around each of these. And fourth, but but quite important is also looking at the credit tolerance that my lender partner offers. And therefore converting that into business rule yep. engines and passing the cases, you know, through a, a credit uh, engine as we call it. We call it credit allocation engine where the relevant credit tolerance-related cases can be matched to relevant lenders are participating in the plan. So there is a massive tech play out here, which is which is ensuring that there is consistency and there is high level of rigor in taking credit So, Mr. Nitin, uh, one thing I noticed, like, apart from your 20-plus lenders, you also secured two rounds of funding during the funding winter, which is like a commendable achievement in itself because I believe you were the only fintech to close two rounds of funding during that particular phase. So I wanted to come across that how tough it is for a founder to raise two rounds of funding when the entire funding in the capital market has dried up and how it significantly impacted your operations. Like how crucial was that funding in securing to you know, enhance the operation and scale up the operations during that phase, which is particularly a lean phase in the startup world. Sure. So, you know, why we didn't, you're right, empirically, we did close two rounds last financial year, uh, last calendar year. And, uh, you know, in fact, we've closed five small rounds in the last two years. But that by no stretch of imagination, uh, you know, says that we are experts at it. We are not. We are also learning. Uh, having said that, I think one thing that has worked in favor of Navdhan is that while we are in the lending business, we have kind of tried to make it very capital efficient. The fact that a lot of my origination sits in the balance sheets of my partner and BFC in banks helps us be more capital efficient and allocate less on capital. The fact that our yeah. FNDG shares are very, very limited because we have shown good quality portfolios or good collection efficiencies has been of help. All of these factors reduce your need for more capital. And when you need yeah. that less capital, you're more comfortable to raise money because you best raise money when you don't need it and not where you desperately need it. So you've been yeah. in that sense comfortable of raising money before we needed the money. And hence, that's been yeah. our journey. But by no stretch of imagination am I suggesting that we are experts at it or we knew how to do it. I would say we are also learning within this process. And how crucial is that for scaling up the operations, even though you raised funding before you needed it? So how do you plan scaling up your operations? Very crucial because extremely crucial, Tanbar, because, you know, go forward. These are businesses that are being built for the next 20 years. These are not the businesses yeah. that are being made, you know, built to say that now my stroll stay me go to the next stage of funding. When you're in a very yeah. long run and you're planning a long race and you're planning a massive scale up from here, you know, so we've grown about 50x in the last two years. We want to grow another 50 to 100x in the next three to four years. If that's the kind of aspiration, it always helps to have sufficient capital in the kitty, both from a risk protection standpoint, as well as from making timely investments in your tech, in your platform, in your channels, which can help you achieve that kind of scale. Okay. And coming to your customer audience for Navadil, 
I noticed in one of the articles wherein it stated that your customer segment is a layer above the microfinance segment and one layer below the traditional MSME sector. So like it's such a niche segment. So I wanted to know what was the specific reason for targeting this yeah. customer audience yeah. when you started up yeah. and what potential this segment has for the Indian landscape. Sure. So, you know, India is growing, right? So the, the middle class, so to speak, in the urban area is also part of the aspirational class. Uh, development yes. has not remained untouched in rural as well. Rural is also good. So while back in the days, there were only rich and poor in the rural areas. Now there is a whole lot of shade of gray. So there are a lot of people who were not so well off earlier, who are now rising up the ranks and their aspirational class even. Yes. Having said that, the markets are still largely informal. They're getting formalized very quickly. We are becoming yep. a channel where informal markets can touch to the formal markets. And therefore, that's okay. the role that we are playing. Why did we choose this space? It's, it's very, very simple. You know, both me and my co-founders, we have worked in, in the lending space or in the banking slash financial services for a uh, you know, varying number of years. Personally, I've been there for almost two and a half decades. We have seen how the markets yes. have evolved in this space. You know, two key developments happened. One was that this is no longer a seller's market. Customers are becoming more and more deserted. They, they yeah. want to have choices and they want to exercise those choices. The access and availability is improved. Having said that, still the right credit is not reaching the right place. Yes. That is one key development. Mm -hmm. The second key development is that the public tech rails have now become very, very effective. In it's uh, playing out in the urban space. You know, the whole UPI search, the whole smartphones yes. and all of those things are playing out in the urban space. It's yet to play out in the rural. And we are one of those early players who's going to make it work and, and leverage on the same playing out in the rural space. Hence, it was a no-brainer for us to kind of choose this. Uh, we have seen that when the customers get discerning, they're also getting discerning because... Even from microfinance space, people are graduating to take larger loans. Their businesses are growing in size. Having said that, they are yet to get to the formal space where they have financial statements coming in. They are still, you know, at times either close to the GST filing stage or yet to begin GST filing. Not that large enough. So that's a massive, yep. I would say, almost 12 crore households in India. This is larger than the SME market itself. We, we knew the time in terms of the size of the market being very large. We knew the fact that this is a customer segment where digital footprints in terms of credit records are available. What we need to discount is the surrogates and the behavioral traits. And that's where my team brings in this capability. Right. So the tech tools that I mentioned to you, where we have yeah. used traditional knowledge to convert it into technology and tech-led tools and tech-led intelligence is where we thought we would have a play and an early movers advantage. Hence, we decided to choose this space. Very interesting. Very interesting because we don't look at it uh, from that lens. And when you look at it from that lens, it becomes pretty evident that you enjoy that first mover advantage into that space. And you mentioned that you knew the TAM from the beginning, that it was huge. So would you say that this market has the potential to accommodate two or four major players if they foray into this space? Well, I would say two or four. I would say it has potential to invest, to absorb many, many more players than just two or four. Uh, it's a very, very massive market. A lot of every techs are working in this case. A lot of fintechs are trying to do inclusive finance. A lot of microfinance yes. companies are trying to offer services above their layer. Uh, we ourselves are working as an extended arm of small finance bags, banks, and VFCs. There's a whole lot of interest. The good part is, the days of exclusive delivery of services is over. And now yeah. the whole financing system is very poor. So earlier there was silos, what banks would do, what NBFCs would do, what fintechs would do. But as you go forward, right. you would see that fintechs will become banks and banks. Our niche is going to be the understanding of the rural small business and building tech for that purpose of underwriting them. But we would ourselves be working in collaboration with a lot of people. So it will be a whole lot of collaborative effort. I, I was just having a, a very detailed call with the morning with another ag agri-tech firm it, uh, exploring a collaboration. Uh, so there is going to be a whole lot of overlaps and therefore a lot of players coming in. Market is massive. 
and I don't think we are fighting for wallet shares yet. Uh, India's economy is just opening up, and the bottom two thirds of the market is yet to explode. Right? It's it's yet yeah. to see its explosion. So once it is really required, a whole lot of more service providers and players come and service from various vantage points. You have built the tech, which not only can help you, can also like help other fintechs or banks in managing their technological aspect. Right? You built ASIN, and you have three verticals which can help, which can cater to various type of customers. So I would want you to explain the three different kind of verticals that you offer, that are which you are mentioned on your website, and how it can help other firms better their tech. No, sure. So I think uh, we are very revenue focused firm first of all. While we are building on the tech approach opportunity, we are also very cognizant that whatever we build has to translate into revenue. Hence, for us, you know, while you spoke about three segments, there is a bunch of sub segments underneath. Uh, okay. Which one to play and when to play and which sequence to play is a revenue led decision for us. Uh, and hence, amongst the oh. three segments that you see, and cash, which is a soup of lending products. It's the one that we have taken to the market first. Uh, we have a okay. few loan variants underneath, which allows us to take care of a bunch of credit needs of those customers. But the same customers, besides credit needs, also have liability requirements. Also have requirements of right. micro savings, micro pensions, investments, same household and the same business has those requirements. We want to come and fill in those requirements and hence, the Endhan product comes in play. Uh, I'll just give you an example. You know, recently in in some of our customers who were growing garlic, they have not windfall gains because the garlic prices went up. Now, yeah. when these customers have got windfall gains, typically the extra incomes they make are going to get either invested in real estate, some yeah. of it will go into wasteful expenditure, and some of it, you know, would just be used to retire loans. Or yep. work purchase. Opportunity to do investments outside real estate or outside just buying a car or you know basic household goods is very, very limited. We yes. want to be the door for them to participate in digital investing and digital savings products, be it backed by gold or be it backed by other instruments. Having the outreach and the network and the trust of these large number of customers. It allows us to offer them services beyond credit, which includes, like I mentioned to you, savings, investments, and others. Okay. And that's the goal object. Now, why we do okay. these types of financing, we also see the customers requiring support in improving the capability to run their businesses. Now, we cannot go and train a farmer who say, how do you grow garlic? We cannot go and train yeah. a, you know, a dairy farmer to say, how do you produce better milk? Or, you yeah. know, tell somebody who's, who's let's say, uh, making wooden furniture, how do you make the furniture better? But what we can do is figure out their data and tech can help them run their regular businesses. Hence, what? we also participate and offer them tech solutions efficiently run their businesses in terms of record keeping, in terms of bookkeeping, in terms of their invoice management, in terms of their payments, and a few bunch of other activities where the NTG vertical comes in here. So these are largely the key three verticals and cash stands for lending and DHAN stands for all financing outside lending and DG stands for tech tools for making our customers run their business more efficient. Thank you so much for that detailed explanation and I think that circles back to your point which you mentioned earlier that this would be a collaborative market wherein many of the players would be seeking collaborations with many players to serve the market as a whole so when you talk about your investment opportunities presenting so i'm assuming you must have uh, thought of it that you may have to tie up with a lot of mutual funds maybe maybe brokers maybe other you know digital world platforms to present those opportunities to such niche segment so i think that point which you mentioned that it all circles down to a collaborative effort to help the niche to help this niche segment grow forward so, like, what trends do you see in today's lending uh, landscape? Like, you, uh, from an unbiased view or from a lens of a common man, what trends do you see 
in the lending space wherein most of the NBFCs would be focused on apart from this two-third uh, niche segment that we mentioned. Sure. You see, first of all, I want to I want to kind of uh, get away from this whole conversation on NBFC versus fintech versus banks. See, all of us yeah. together are service providers, and these names are are you know um, a little confusing because uh, you know a fintech could be a bank yeah. or a bank could be a fintech or an NBFC fintech. Most of the fintechs are ending up taking NBFC licenses, so uh, let's yeah. not differentiate it on those bases. So eventually, customers, customer service, uh, some purpose that is being served, and is it being served tech led or is it being served, uh, you know, purely human led? Is the only differentiation. Having said that, since your question is in terms of what trends we have seen, I think one of the key trends I would say is that given the trust factor, regulatory compliances are going to be extremely important, and these are not risks. You know, playing the game right way, playing the game with the rules is important. And mm. it's a zero-one game. If you don't follow the rules, you're out. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Hence, being regulatory compliant and following the rules of the game is important. I must also differentiate that uh, there is a law, there is a rule, there is a norm, there is a direction. All of these are not same right. words. Quite often, we get confused to treat all of them as overlapping. Hence, yep. it becomes very important to read in, in the spirit of the game. So what is the spirit of the law? What is the spirit of the rule? People try to find arbitrage in between lines and sentences, in rules and directions and stuff like that, and try to build cheeky businesses. I think it's a bad idea. Right. Uh, sooner than later, yep. regulation will come. And it will allow you to innovate. But once you have innovated and gone to a scary which is beyond the tolerance limits, problems will come. So that's one clear direction which is visible today. The other direction I would say is customer protection and responsible services. Customers will make a choice. They will access product from you. They will take a loan from you. Yeah. But are they repaying the loan to you or not? It will be a customer decision. Be it a secure yeah. loan, a secure loan, BNPL product, consumer credit, you name whatever you want to call it. Are you getting the money back from the customer? Is the customer deciding to pay you back? Mm. Is going to be a key trend. And therefore, when we build a service provision, we need to make sure that we build the full service circle. We just don't go look at GTM and CAC. You have to look at the full service yeah. provision to say that the money has to come back as real and further. I think these two trends are very designing, with very, very visible to me. I completely agree with the view that you have to like think of the end when you once you begin right so coming back to your point that it's a full circle you can't just think about the gtm and the cac and your uh, lending operations or supply partners but you also have to think of the end that that money has to be credited back credited back in your account or your lender's account right so i believe that's a very important perspective i would say that we have to look at once we think of these service providers catering to different needs so uh, one thing that I've heard the most like, and I'm sure you must have observed this trend, that India has always been a credit thirsty country. Like one reasonable guess is the population dynamics, which play a vital role in this. And what other reasons could you think like, you would agree that this trend has been keeping up that India is always a credit thirsty country and thus innovative products or different services can be opened up and it will scale up massively. So what do you think are the key reasons for India being a credit thirsty country and this trend keeping up since a lot of decades? Well, yeah, so, you know, a lot of macroeconomic data gets thrown out to us in terms of credit to GDP ratio, household incomes ratio, and so many other uh, ratios which tell us that we are a credit thirsty country or a credit hungry country. Uh, I have a slightly different take on this. I think there are pockets of oversupply and there are pockets of shortage, both coexisting in the market today. I think it is because lending or credit has become commoditized, has become productized. Because of yeah. which some of the products which have scaled up have become priced and probably in oversupply. While some of the requirements which are under serviced are still in the realm of, you know, having massive difficulty. 
For us as practitioners, it is important to identify those trends. And therefore, we need to keep our eyes and ears very close to the ground. We need to keep traveling. We need to keep meeting people. We need to keep understanding how the market is evolving. A lot of people sitting in Bangalore looking at their mates and their drivers take decisions of how India is behaving. Well, the yeah. Bangalore mates and Bangalore drivers, it's not India. Right? So India yeah. is, you know, in Ospain, yeah. which is 300 kilometers or 400 kilometers away from Bangalore, how a rural small business is trying to service their working capital requirements, how their fabricator is trying to buy a welding machine and not if they have money to do it. How a dairy farmer is trying to pour milk, but the cooperative milk pouring center is not close by it. He has to sell it to the aggregator, where the terms of yeah. trade are not favorable. So, you know, the, the neat part, I'll let me say the clean lies in the detail. If we understand the requirements well, if we are able to find the right pockets, then we can make it a large play, and that's where the hunger for credit lies. But if you look at how oh. microfinance has grown or how the Ziba credit has grown in India, today it doesn't matter. Even if you have a 10,000 rupee loan, you're a security guard somewhere, you don't have any job security also, you still get a good consumer credit. You will repay that loan or not is your choice, but you get the credit. So access in some of those, for example, the blue collar economy, access to credit is, is overheated. So we need to identify oh. which are the areas, which are the gaps. But at a summarization level, I will say, Right credit, at the right time, at the right terms. If these three, four things are taken together, then there is a lot of credit hunger and we need to fill it. But otherwise, there is enough supply. There is commoditized credit, right? So every year, people fall short of their credit disbursement targets. There is enough, enough, enough means of life. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting perspective to look at once you bifurcate these two different segments and look at it from each individual segment, then, then it makes sense that one is oversupplied and one is undersupplied. So, Mr. Nathan, I wanted to talk about like how were your initial days in your career? Like you were with the Times Group for a couple of years and then you moved up to the lending space and then uh, became the CEO of Inteligro and uh, Spandana Spurti as well. So how were the initial days and how did it help you, like, massively build out something of your own? You know, everybody tries to romanticize their initial days, but I would say my initial days were a lot of struggle. Uh, you know, the newspaper industry taught me how to be awake all night. And uh, not really worry about concepts like work-life balance. Because uh, that that's how the industry is. Uh, having said that, media also brought me to a lot of is it and bit about the realities of life and what is portrayed and what is right and what is not. To that extent, I think knowing the reality was was something which hit me hard. And when I got into rural space and I started traveling into interiors, I realized that there is so much scope to work on. And your heart doesn't, you know, need to be bleeding for the rural poor. You need to go out there and do some work, make some meaningful contribution. So they have been lucky to yeah. have those kind of vocations, job roles, where not only in India, but across a lot of, uh, you know, other, uh, I would say, middle income countries. Also, I got an exposure to see what's happening. In banking itself, I got to run products uh, on the product tech side, microfinance, gold loans, channel finance, which now is called BNBL, uh, you know, corporate yeah. and retail businesses, those kind of products to see how, how markets play between the informality of the business and the formality of the business. So, uh, you know, I would say formatting me for formative years or initial years were great learning experience. I got to travel into deep interiors. I stayed in over 200 villages in the first four years of my career uh, across various states in India and like I mentioned, a few other countries as well. It's quite a revealing and quite a learning experience. I come in from a, from a, from the state of Uttar Pradesh. And when I was staying in villages in places like Uttapadai near Madurai or Nagarpuri, the commerce was very different. Or if you go to Malapuram yeah. in Kerala, you know, you go to Kutch in Gujarat, it's not the same place, it's not the same variables, it's not the same country. It's very, very diverse. Understanding the yes. diversity and still pulling on common traits to build a common service provision, I would have been able to do today had I not had those kind of experiences in my 
and it all circles down to your point of completing the whole circle right when you look back at those days then you realize that today it makes a lot of sense having those experiences even though they would have been the struggle at that time so uh, mr nitin like what are your uh, aspirations and you know grand vision statement for the next 3 to 5 years for navadan and for you personally as well revenue yes. that we get from customers um, is is one of our north star metrics that in the next 4 years what is the figure that we want to reach we have set this target out for ourselves 3 years back um in this 5 year journey or 6 years journey that we had set out for ourselves we are bang on target as we speak uh Great. so i think we are building it out for the purpose the purpose is to build scale uh some of our people who work in the traditional lending space i would say what they achieved in 20 years journey i want to make it happen in 5 to 7 years i think that's a, like that sort of aspiration is what we require in today's generation that you think on those lines wherein you can uh, i believe it was elon musk that said that if you can reduce your 10 year target to 1 year you may not be able to achieve it but you will get far ahead than you would have gone in 5 years so i think you are right on that track and i hope that you achieve the target in the next 4 years which you have laid down the number for revenue for your uh, business so any last advice for our audience and for the budding entrepreneurs in today's generation like what to do and what not to do a couple of things or generic advice when well, i will just say two things I, and this is not advice this i would say is is things which have helped me in my life i can just share them all with experience and and not really call it an advice because i don't think i'm an authority yet to give any advice see one thing that no. has worked for me is this very very crystal clear focus on revenues whatever we yeah. do it has to result into a revenue a lot of people say that you build a great product revenues will come i am i do not belong to that school of thought i would rather say it has to serve a purpose it has to generate revenue as it builds for it is how i look at that's number one number two i would say that you know entrepreneurship is a lonely journey and it can get yeah. very frustrating it has exhilarations and it has its own pains and and its pitfalls it's extremely important to have right quality of co-founders if you find the right quality of co-founders if you can get the culture fit right they help you in turn build an institution my job here as as the founder of namtha is not just to build out a business it's also to be an internal culture mascot to make sure that what we're, what we're building out is going to last beyond us we are building it for skin we are building it for for stable profitability and we are building it with a clear focus on good quality customer service because we do not give good quality customer service customer is not going to come back customers are not going to continue yeah. to pay for it so i think these two right. things uh, i would say have really helped help me i hope uh, you know it helps others as well yeah i i completely agree and like i also feel that which school of thought that you have that focus on revenues from the right get go right because we have heard uh, a lot that first build up the product or service and if that's good your revenues will come either in 2 years 3 years or 5 years but that school of thought wherein from day one you are focusing on revenues i think that helps you build out a very long sustainable business and helps you massively scale once the customers have tested the service and they become your regular customers thank you so much mr nitin for your time it was quite an insightful discussion and i'm yeah. sure i have taken away a lot of interesting perspectives and our audience will do so thank you so much for giving us your time i wish you all the best thank you so much sanbai thanks for speaking to me i i had good fun in the in the process great thank you so much